Hello everybody and welcome back. So now we're going to talk about chemicals um, and how they can be used to destroy microbes. So the effectiveness of chemicals is dependent on the type of chemical. So we have some chemicals that are called sterilants. These destroy basically everything. Um, we have high level disinfectants that can um, destroy viruses and vegetative cells, but they don't always destroy endospores. We have intermediate level disinfectants um, that destroy vegetative cells and they can destroy certain viruses as well as um, mycobacteria and fungi. And then we have low level disinfectants which destroy um, vegetative cells except for mycobacteria and they can destroy enveloped viruses, but not the non-enveloped viruses. Uh, they can also destroy some fungi. Germicides are regulated by both the FDA and the EPA, and you have to follow instructions to make sure that they are effective at their job. If you're not following instructions properly, then the germicide may not destroy the microbes like they say they will. So let's look at how we determine what germicide to use. So there are multiple um, factors that come into play. The first would be toxicity. The chemical has to be less toxic than the risk of whatever microbes you're trying to get rid of. So if the, the chemical is more toxic and causes more problems than the microbes would, you wouldn't use it. Um, how well does the germicide work in the presence of organic materials? So a lot of times we're using germicides to clean um, the skin tissue to, um, you know, like a wound on a child's knee or something. And there's a lot of organic material that's going to be there. So if, if the germicide doesn't work in the presence of organic material, then it's probably not going to be effective. Um, is it compatible with what you're utilizing it on, using it on? So um, an example there is liquids can't be used on electrical materials because that would short out the electrical materials. Does it leave any residues? And if so, are the residues um, corrosive or toxic? How expensive is it? How easy is it to get? How long can you store it? These are all things that we have to look at. Um, and what is the environmental risk? So we talked about toxicity benefits must be weighed against the risk of use. But so that's for individuals, but you also have to look at the environment. Are we releasing toxic chemicals into the environment that can cause all kinds of problems? If so, then that might not be a chemical we want to use. So let's look at some of these chemicals and a lot of these we've used in our own houses already. Um, alcohol. Alcohol is um, effective at killing vegetative cells as well as um, most fungi, but it does not kill endospores or does not um, kill endospores and it does not um, inactivate non-enveloped viruses. It works by denaturing proteins and damaging the cell's membranes. Alcohol is used typically as a disinfectant or an antiseptic. Um, it is non-toxic. It's relatively inexpensive. Some of the limitations is it does evaporate rel rather quickly and it can damage certain uh, materials. So now let's talk about aldehydes. So aldehydes include formaldehyde, glutaraldehyde. Um, the function of your aldehydes are they inactivate proteins and nucleic acids. Um, they can be used to sterilize certain materials, but if they are used um, in a sterilization process, then you do have to rinse them very thoroughly because um, aldehydes tend to be very toxic and can potentially be uh, mutagenic or cancer causing. Um, a form of formaldehyde is called formalin. 
um, formalin is what we use to preserve specimens in our labs. Uh, if you take a general biology class or an anatomy and physiology class, you will see uh, eventually you'll get to um, dissect different worms or frogs or um, I'm thinking gen bio and then pigs or cats in anatomy and physiology. And um, they're stored, preserved in a formalin solution. So this is very effective at destroying microbes and preserving materials, but it doesn't um, preserve everything. And that's where I bring this picture in. Um, so I got these from Google Images. I just looked up Ascaris lumbricoides eggs and um, infection. And these pictures were two of the most common ones. So this is an Ascaris lumbricoides egg. This is a super big picture of an egg. So these are super tiny. Um, and these are Ascaris lumbricoides worms. These worms are a very common, one of the most common infectious um, parasitic worms in the US, um, but they're found all over the world. And their eggs actually don't get killed from the formalin. So the eggs, though we have the preserved specimens and the specimens are dead, the eggs are still viable, which means they can still, um, if you were to swallow one, they could hatch in your gut. We have biguinides, um, which includes your chlorhexidine. Chlorhexidine is a very common biguinide. Um, it's used in antiseptics. Um, it is commonly found in skin creams and in mouthwashes. Um, it functions by uh, in destroying vegetative cells as well as fungi and enveloped viruses. We have ethylene oxide. This is a um, very um, toxic and carcinogenic chemical. Ethylene oxide, because of its toxicity and um, dangerousness, it we use special machines that that will take in the ethylene oxide, will um, sterilize the whatever materials we have in the um, chamber, and then we release that gas and um, we use heat to get rid of the gas for about 8 to 12 hours before we can actually open the chamber back up. So this is used um, to sterilize things that are in like fabrics. So say you want to sterilize this, I mean a mattress, that would be something you might um, utilize this for. Um, certain electrical equipment that you can't use other mechanisms for sterilizing. We have halogens. Halogens are what we use to clean water supplies and to disinfect surfaces and um, skin. So chlorine is the most common halogen that we that we discuss. Um, it can destroy pretty much everything. We use a 1 in 100 dilution of chlorine um, in our Clorox bleach. Um, if we have, and so we use very, very low levels in drinking water, but certain species, which um, I think I've talked about at the beginning of this chapter, um, can survive. So Cryptosporidium oocysts are able to survive as will giardia cysts um, and these can cause different diseases. Uh, then we have, oh, and they can also, chlorine can make organic materials, those um, byproducts that can be potentially toxic. So they work by um, disrupting the plasma membrane and damaging the DNA. Iodine is another form of a halogen. So iodine kills vegetative cells, but it does not get rid of endospores. Um, iodine can be used um, to clean skin 
before a procedure is done, but because iodine can be um, irritating to the skin, they tend to utilize um, iodine and mix it with another organic molecule forming an iodophore, which is less irritating to the skin. Um, one of the limitations to iodine is Pseudomonas species can survive in the solution. And Pseudomonas tends to be a very common um, hospital acquired infection because of that. The next we have metal compounds. And actually, you know what? I, it's been 10 minutes and I don't like to go that long. So I'm going to stop here and I'll finish up in the next um, lecture. So you guys have a great day. Bye.